Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Chuck Hardy, the Chief Architect of the General Services Administration. And to start today's program, I'd like you all uh, to stand for the national anthem. It's a privilege to welcome you to the design, GSA's Design Awards. Buildings, interiors, landscapes, and art have the capacity to improve lives. Today, we celebrate that fact. As you'll see shortly, private sector experts and their GSA teammates use design, engineering, art, and preservation to maximize a project benefits to the public. But first, we're gonna talk about the pursuit of public benefits across GSA starting with Nina Albert, the Commissioner of our Public Building Service. For those that haven't read Citizenship in a Republic by Teddy Roosevelt, I would recommend it. It speaks of being in the arena and not a bystander, a doer of deeds, someone who fails while daring greatly, but also knows the triumph of high achievement. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to a great doer of deeds and someone who, who does do things, uh, Nina Albert, our Commissioner. All right, wow, that's a lot more pressure than I anticipated getting. Um, thanks, Chuck. Thank you all for coming here today, for traveling, uh, for coming to celebrate um, the work that uh, you and your teams have done. Uh, I've seen some family members, so thank you for coming uh, to celebrate your family members who've, uh, maybe you haven't had insight into how impactful uh, the things that they work on from day to day has on the American people. And um, so anyway, I also want to just reflect a minute on the importance and power of public buildings. I think we all know it, but I think it's important to keep reminding ourselves of what the opportunity is every time we're faced with uh, a project to tackle. Um, so for me, I think of public buildings as being a great convener of ideas Oftentimes, one of the few times that communities get to come together and debate, um, you know, what their identity is, um, and, um, and and share what their interests as a community are. We're often uh, economic engines uh, that provide opportunities for local talent and businesses to participate in. Our buildings are often the anchor to public spaces and civic centers, and they endure. Um, and become part of the historic fabric of communities. And last but not least, and particularly important at this moment in time, is that with GSA in particular, our public buildings set the standard for green building. And as we try and achieve net zero uh, by 2045, this standard of excellence, the amount of creativity that it's gonna take to achieve that benchmark, that what I call a moonshot goal, has never been more important. So I'm really glad that we're able to invigorate the design awards. Uh, we've got a lot of projects to catch up on because it's been about six years since we've convened um, and recognized the work um, all across the country. The teams represented today exemplify creative problem solving and the highest standard of excellence. I was looking at the awards program 
And I was struck by the words of our jury chair, Kurt Moody. In his jury report, he said, few awards programs have as direct an impact on building quality as this one. When juries identify patterns of excellence or individual bright spots in a pool of competition submissions, GSA takes steps to transform those strengths into standards. So building quality, patterns of excellence, taking strengths and converting them to standards. Those words define the projects recognized here today, as well as the design excellence program in general. Before I leave the stage, I want to touch upon two projects, uh, particularly for um, the level of sustainability and creativity um, that, that they've achieved. Uh, the first project is the Land Port of Entry in Columbus, New Mexico. Uh, it has a very unique photo photovoltaic roof with a sawtooth profile uh, that references the nearby mountain range. The landscaping in Columbus also provides water harvesting to reduce flooding, and native flora are also drought resistant and more absorbing um, and, and water absorbent. The other project I want to recognize is the US Courthouse in Los Angeles, which has a very interesting pleated glass structure. Um, and it's uh, designed in such a way that uh, it maximizes daylight but minimizes heat coming uh, from the uh, east and west uh, sun uh, trajectory. This combination with the felt of photovoltaic roof and extensive outside light um, has led to LEED Platinum certification. And we're very proud of that. One last thing, uh, there are project credits listed on our um, online program. Uh, I believe it's on page 63. Uh, there are so many fields uh, of expertise that are represented and required to deliver these projects. And so please do take some time uh, to recognize the people uh, who played such an important role in creating and delivering these projects. So with that, for all of you, those of you who've participated in these design awards, who are recipients of these awards, congratulations. Thank you uh, for coming today. And uh, it is now my distinct pleasure uh, and honor to introduce GSA's administrator, Robin Carnahan. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Chuck. And all of you for being here. It is a wonderful day of celebration. Um, first, just let me say congratulations to everybody who's here today representing winning projects. I uh, also want to say thanks to the jurors who are all sitting over there. Thank you very much for the time that you put into this and the seriousness uh, with which you took it. It means a lot to us, uh, and it's a great value to uh, our country. So please, round of applause. For You know, I, I've had the chance to visit dozens of uh, our buildings around the country um, at, to, over the last year or so, and it's been new courthouses that want to reimagine how justice is viewed in their communities. It's visiting land ports of entry, as Nina mentioned, that both are important for the security of our country, but also commerce and welcome people as their first entry point into our country. I visited federal workspaces that are being reimagined for what the world looks like in this new hybrid environment. And I've seen and passed by and been moved by artwork and memorials that the teams have put together, including uh, Mo Brooker's Spirit of the Spirit. So thank you to Mo's family for being here today. I had a chance to be there for the dedication of that. Sometimes in these visits, I am in the sort of back rooms looking at broken down electrical systems or heat pumps, things that need to be replaced. But more often than not, I'm also able to see renovations in progress and sometimes I even get to show up uh, when the project is completed and we're all celebrating and opening the doors to the public. But no matter where I go, the importance of these federal buildings is not lost on anyone. They are anchors in their communities we have 2,200 of them around in the center of communities. They often spur development and commerce and growth, and that's why it is so important for us, no matter what we're doing in our federal spaces, to be closely tied to the communities where they're located. 
whether it's a new construction, historic preservation, we always go first to the communities to understand what their growth plans are and how we can fit into those. So to me, GSA is much more than being a federal landlord. We are a place that is the, the holder and the steward of these public assets that have deep meaning for both their communities and I would say for our democracy. And that's why we are always thinking about the mission of our tenants. We're thinking about how we can make sure these facilities reflect the America we want reflected to the people. So your innovations, your focus on sustainability, your reflection of the best of us is so important. You know, we also always try to incorporate art and history whenever we can. Uh, so that our spaces also reflect the identities uh, of our communities. And so I, I want to th say thanks again, because the people that are g getting honored today are folks who understand all that complex web that we try to spin. That it's not just a building. It is not just a workspace. That its place in the community is much more significant than that. So. I know that you all have put your heart and souls into this from the design at the beginning, thinking about it, to fighting your way through the construction period, to finally delivering this for the public, both landmark buildings and world-class pieces of art. So just thank you, thank you. Uh, I will speak on behalf of the American people and thank you for your vision and your passion about that and speaking so eloquently uh, to the government's unique role in our communities. So I know that we have an opportunity, this is sort of getting back on track, that for a few years we haven't done these design awards, and I will tell you we're really excited to be doing them again. And one more thing, uh, we intend to keep going. One of the reasons we know we're gonna be able to keep going is because we got a big infusion of money uh, in some of these recent bills, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill, as well as the Inflation Reduction Act. And so we're gonna be investing in more facilities. So I hope all of you, had a good experience working with GSA and our teams, and we'll keep your eyes open for new opportunities uh, in that realm. Um, I want to just pivot for a second and talk about uh, the art and architecture program, because as many of you know, we spend one half of 1% of every major construction project on public art. Stop and think about that, it's kind of amazing. It's been around for 50 years now. We're celebrating the 50th anniversary. It has been a tremendous investment for the American people to have this level of, of art uh, in our portfolio and something that is owned by the public. And we are extremely lucky today to be able to be joined for a keynote address by the director of the Art and Architecture Program and Fine Arts Program at GSA, Jennifer Gibson. So please join me in welcoming Jennifer. Thanks. Thank you, Robin, for that introduction. And uh, thank you, all of you, for being here. It's, uh, as Robin said, this is the year we're marking the 50th anniversary of art and architecture. And we're celebrating these amazing works that are in communities, large, small, throughout the country, on the border, in the middle of urban, major urban areas. I'm honored to be, able, be the person who gets to speak about it today and share the history of art and architecture with you. The collection itself is the result of a commitment of the federal government and of GSA to ensure that art, that the, that visual record exists and is part of our construction process, to the um, staff members in the art and architecture program and the fine arts programs, and all of the project managers and construction um, professionals at GSA who make sure these projects are realized and to the private sector, to all of the architects, many of you out there, to the artists, to the arts professionals who provide us guidance as we're going along. And I think what we need to keep in mind as I show, I'm going to show you a survey of 50 years, you're gonna see a lot of work very quickly without a lot of explanation. Um, it's mo the artists are at the center of this. It's their vision, it's their creativity. They come and work with us we don't direct them. We're looking for, to them not to reflect who we are, but to open up new possibilities. 
And so I thank the arts community very much for participating over these 50 years. The um, Just as Prelude Art and Architecture was really, its foundation is in the guiding principles for federal architecture from 1962, which we all talk about architectural design, but there's a line in there that actually says fine art should be incorporated in the designs with emphasis on the work of living American artists. And that's what we've been doing for 50 years. With, as with architectural design, we, our direction is to seek contemporary artists to create works that reflect the dignity, enterprise, vigor, and stability of the American national government, and as with architectural design, to not have an official style. And so the works that I will show you reflect that broad array of types of work, types of work there is no single style that the government promotes. There is no single artist to whom we go and say, produce our federal, the image of the federal government. Rather, it's hundreds of artists. Since um, the foundation of the program in 1972, we have commissioned over 500 works. And um, the directive was given in the uh, fall of 72 to start an art and architecture program. And by September, or by, I'm sorry, early 73, Alexander Calder was already under contract to create what has become sort of the lodestone of the art and architecture program at the Chicago Federal Center um, Flamingo. When that work was created, it was greeted with great Public celebration, this is not the norm for all of our art. It often comes in quite quietly. Um, but here we had a circus parade, speeches by public officials, a balloon launch. So obviously it was the government embracing this new idea of we're going to incorporate art in our buildings and we're going to bring in great artists, we're going to bring in artists from communities. It's going to be a broad view of what America is. So as I've said, I'm just, I, as I was thinking about what, how to talk about today, many of you have been at art and architecture talks and we show works and we're often showing what might be called the greatest hits or the highlights, but I thought it's worthwhile to sort of look at the broad range of what has been commissioned to give you an idea of, yeah, there really is a lot of different type of art that has been, um, purchased or commissioned by the government. And they, these works are all original works created for f federal facilities. The um, starting, and I won't have time to talk about all of these, but you'll see they're in chronological order. So it will give you an idea of how art, public art forms have changed over the decades. And um, the range of materials and styles, the way art has been incorporated into uh, federal spaces. The um, bicentennial was a moment when a number of commissions um, were um, realized, including this by Louise Nevelson. Another work in Chicago in the 70s, early 80s, it was that kind of monumental work that was often at the center of our, the program. Oops. But I think we have very early on clear evidence that we were not privileging any particular material or form. Here, Lenore Tani created a textile work. Uh, she subsequently became one of the major textile artists in the country. So we're fortunate to have this early work by her. And another early work that I think it's remarkable that the panels, and these are all selected by panels or recommend, recommended by panels, had the foresight to commission Sam Gilliam. Um, Gilliam died earlier in, well, in uh, June of 22, but uh, at the end of his life was recognized basically as the towering black American painter. And uh, GSA is fortunate to have four of his works in our collection that reflects his development as an artist over the decades. And I think that's one of the other interesting aspects of this collection, that we sometimes have work from an early period of an artist's career and then later on as, um, as they developed. The, to give you an idea of like in one year, what could go on? 
Here we have Alex Katz at the Molo Building in the center of, uh, well, in lower Manhattan, images of New Yorkers. Katz continues to work today. He's in his late 90s. And in contrast, in Alaska, we're commissioning panels, and these um, by Carmen Quinto Plunkett, uh, that were based on Klingit's myth. So she was working from her own heritage. As Robin mentioned, we have one half of 1% of estimated construction to commission these original works. And it's for all new buildings and major modernizations. We commissioned for headquarter buildings, um, federal buildings of all types, laboratories, courthouses, and land ports of entry. So the collection is quite varied, and the conditions that the artists have to address are varied. Here, if, as you leave this building, you can walk into the Gold Post Office and see um, Robert Irwin's work, which totally integrated architecturally with a historic building, mirroring the architecture of the site with the panels, uh, reflecting the light that comes through the atrium window. The, one of the questions I'm asked frequently, and I've had people actually say to me, oh, do you get to pick the artist? No. Um, definitely not. It is, as we talked about art and architecture, it's collaboration. It's that the whole selection process is quite collaborative and involves a panel of seven members. The panel sizes have changed, changed over the years, but the panels always include the lead designer, somebody who's representing the interests of the client, and the um, community. So. Um, and we're looking for somebody who understands the needs and uh, desires of a community. It also includes arts professionals and GSA, and they make recommendations on what kind of art might be appropriate in this site that meets the needs of the building of the community and of this uh, high standard of art. Um, the artists are not directed to create any particular kind of work, but instead are provided a lot of information about the site and uh, the significance. Just pausing here briefly because um, at the Adabo building, which is located in Jamaica, Queens, which is the most ethnically diverse county in the country, we have uh, works outside the Melvin Edwards and inside these are two of the four panels um, that really relate to that community, but also to the tenant, which is the Social Security Administration. And there are many people coming in and out of the building. So it's um, having work like this that people can look at it and understand, I think, is important. Versus uh, Sanborn's work for the CIA, none of us get to go see that. Uh, and, but. He worked with a cryptographer to write the message that's on this centerpiece of the work. And it has, continues, all these years later, to be a challenge and has not been fully translated. So if you, if you Google Sanborn CIA, you'll immediately get lots of uh, news about it. And so, as I'm saying, the artists are responding to the site, to the location. And as, you're, as you look through this, you see some of the work is realistic, some is quite abstract, uh, some are traditional murals, Valadez's work in El Paso, which is a compilation of different views of El Paso over the several centuries. Um, and others are become, while realistic, have other kinds of qualities to them. And I think this is one of the interesting aspects of our program, when we have an artist start a project, they, we don't say to them, do this kind of work, or here's what we want to see. We're asking them to learn about the project, learn about what's important, and to create the work that's appropriate for the site. And um, they're being judged on their prior work when they're being selected. And in this instance, uh, with um, Diana Moore, I thought it was interesting that as she was starting her design process, she said that she was encouraged to create a work that featured 12 jurors because the panel wanted to represent different ethnic identities. And instead, her response was to create this single monumental head of justice whose eyes are at the height of 
at the eye level of an average person. But this uh, figure that would combine a mix of cultural and uh, racial distinctions that might better reflect the ideal of the country. And it's that kind of looking at a challenge and coming up with a solution that's so wonderful um, in the, um, what the arts bring to our projects. Another approach to justice with Ray Caskey, and then another courthouse, and, you'll, and I will be showing lots of courthouses because we do a lot of them, but Maya Lynn Sounding Stones outside the Moynihan Courthouse, which is completely different. It's a much more an intimate experience and um, modeled on a uh, scholar's rock garden. It's about public and private because you can go up and look through it and see through all of the aligned stones. You hear the water that's inside. It's also located in the vicinity of Chinatown. And so Myelin was very much thinking about that community. A work I hope you go to stop to see as you're leaving here, Martin Purrier's uh, monumental sculpture in the uh, plaza here, where he's, it has a certain organic human quality to it, despite being so large. And as Purrier noted, in a democracy, people talk back to the government. And so while it can be seen as a monument, it can also be seen as our representative. Artists often respond to the site. Barbara Chase Rabot's Africa Rising, which is marvelous work in lower Manhattan in the Weiss Federal Building, to note the African Burial Ground National Monument. Haven't been showing buildings, but just to show another way artists work, where their work is incorporated very much into the design of the building and they're responding to the design, with, such as with Ellsworth Kelly's 21 panels um, in the Moakley Courthouse in Boston. They provide sort of an order and point of focus uh, that contrasts with the view outside the panoramic uh, window that faces Boston Harbor. And Bennett Breen, in contrast, just a year later doing this work that draws upon his own Chippewa Indian heritage. The, every panel that meets thinks differently. And um, we're the GSA people who are, participate are not saying, here's what we want. We're very much asking them to tell us what they're interested in. And um, I've shown several works in glass that you see panels and all comprised of those seven people, um, but different people for every project, um, come up with radically different recommendations of artists and the artists come up with different solutions. Here Jamie Carpenter's lens ceiling, obviously totally architecturally integrated, serving a functional role as well as an aesthetic one versus Mahadi, uh, Michaela Mahadi's work in um, Brownsville, where the panel was interested in recording the pictorial history of Brownsville. And so it's a series of etchings that came from a photographic uh, record of the town. Dale Chihuly's work, quite exuberant in a fairly austere space. And um, another work, David Wilson's, where it's integrated into the wall and work represents monumental columns rather than being the columns that we think about actually in the glass engaged with the window. We're also dealing with all of these gigantic land ports of entry and in the coming years, we're gonna be uh, working on a number of new projects, many of them quite remote. It's something for an artist to tackle, but here you just see the artists who were responding to the expanse of the uh, northern Montana landscape. It's an earthwork and uh, it includes earth and rocks. The, uh, in contrast, in a different way of considering time, Brian Schurer did murals that are in the courtrooms of the annex. Um, for, created at the Weiss Courthouse in Pittsburgh. There were New Deal murals in the existing courtrooms, and he created murals for the new courtrooms that address Pittsburgh past and present. And another type of passage, Inigo Mangalo Ovalle's work uh, for the um, Citizen and Immigration Services uh, Department in Chicago, where the clouds we, there are many ways it could be interpreted, but one thought is that they're not held back by national boundaries. They're passing 
through. Community involvement, as I've said, is a role both in the panels and in um, some of the artists. Tim Rollins and KOS, Kids of Survival, created a number of works. They, we have two commissions by Rollins, who was um, now deceased, but they had a collective practice that used literary texts as the basis for paintings and prints. Here he worked with local schools and the Circle of Nations, Wap Wapaton Indian School, to create this mural. Whereas Jean Shin in, Buffalo, in Baltimore uh, worked with the two main tenants, the Veterans Administration and Citizen and Immigration Services, and had people donate clothing. And that clothing became the material of her murals. And each of those individuals is recognized on a plaque. And it's interesting because people come in and point to their like orange pants that are on the wall. Um, and another work that uh, was very much responds to its community, Alan Michelson's, um, which um, addresses that nation motion of boundaries. And here it's Canada, the United States, as well as the Agawasani tribal nation. And the images are from 19th century uh, panorama postcards and wampum belts. And this is uh, on the wall of the main uh, port building. Artists who participate in the program are just required to be US citizens or lawful permanent residents. And so any artist can be considered for a commission. We asked artists to join the National Registry, Artist Registry, and basically they then become eligible for projects anywhere in the country. Which means if you're an artist in Idaho, we may never come and build a building, or it may be a decade or two between GSAs doing federal construction. Doesn't mean you can't participate. You could be considered for the project in Silver Spring. Um, so the artists are not bound by their locale. locale. So while we don't do provide a preference for local artists, we do ident try work to identify artists from an area so that their work can be considered amongst the pool. Just showing you a few more courthouses from realistic paintings of historic events to um, a glass wall based on photography. This work on the main border, and that's the other aspect. These are works everywhere. And um, this one um, by Nina Kachadurian is has the emblematic symbols of Maine. The, there's the, the state, the moose is the state mammal, and he has a whoopie pie, which is the state treat, and et cetera. Leonardo's Drew's work in uh, Houston, the, which uses urban materials, reclaimed and reworked. Just a few others where art truly is integrated. Mi Jun Yun's piece is across the canopy of the uh, land port of entry. San Ysidro, as cars pass through, the lights move. And another work at San Ysidro. A work you'll be seeing later, Catherine Opie's um, Yosemite Falls, which uses the space of the Los Angeles courthouse uh, to activate the artwork and our imaginations. Some projects are small projects, but have big impact and are completely integrated. Um, this one by uh, Billings and Wasserman really reflects the, um, and you're getting two slides by these because one was 20, 2017, the wall, which was uh, precast with patterns that they had created, and 2018, the um, wood that was placed above the desks in the building. Other works, again, completely integrated, but responding to the site. Here, Ryan McGinnis creating a, uh, 50 symbols, that hieroglyphic symbols, basically, that respond, that account for cultural and environmental um, elements, pictorial symbols, that um, have been reduced and in, to simplified glyphs and that are part of the parking structure. The artwork becomes a beacon sometimes, a work that we'll be seeing again later, recently installed. The, um, I'm going to show, here I'm sort of cheating. I'm giving you two, probably think two a year because uh, we're, uh, just to show some of the amazing things that are going on uh, right now with, um, here Joyce Kozlov who did 17 panels for the Greenville Courthouse that celebrate the history of map making and the, uh, 
rich textile traditions in the upstate South Carolina area that this court is responsible for, or Allison Schott's Robes of Justitia, which you'll also be seeing again, that uh, inspired by classical drape drapery. Ellen Driscoll, um, as you can see, we've done lots of courthouses in the South recently. Um, this one in Charlotte. And the work is a history of the site, of the building, and um, brings together a lot of local elements in a series of seven panels that right, are, are right along the street so that the public has the opportunity to see them. And I think that's one thing I want to mention. All of this work is always intended for the public to be in the most publicly accessible part of a facility. I know it's not always easy to get into federal buildings, but uh, they'll be on the outside. If they're on the inside, they're going to be in those areas of the building where you would be able to see them. And I'll show you, finally, last, two last works. Um, Nick Cave's work that is, is a beaded tapestry. And uh, it's installed in a building that underwent a modernization. And it's inspired by, the, it's a Latin motto, um, it's part of the uh, Detroit City motto, that says it will rise from the ashes. And Cave very much sees this work as reflecting the spirit of rebirth and renewal in Detroit. And finally, most recently installed, and uh, is Adam Savanovich's Landscapes, the site of war, and this is a series of, I believe, 17 paintings, but it's over a thousand feet of painting, and this they're located in hallways in what was a um, military building with endless hallways. So suddenly these spaces are demarcated, and the landscapes look quite calm, but they are all sites where American military has fought a major war over the past two and a half centuries. So to wrap up, last year, GSA um, and the National Endowment for the Arts signed a memorandum of agreement to promote opportunities for artists and to ensure that we reach communities that we might otherwise miss. I hope that by looking at the survey today that you see we've reached a lot of communities and a lot of different artists. Um, and we look forward to continuing this incredible program that um, I'm privileged to be part of. And um, in addition to all those land ports of entry, we'll be doing new courthouses and some federal buildings. We're also going to be launching a new website, so you'll be able to more readily look at all of this collection. So in closing, art and architecture really is a collaborative effort. And uh, at the heart, heart of it is the artist, but it's everybody else helping us realize it. So thank you. Great job, and thank you, Jennifer. You can see all the fun stuff we do, and that just shows, I mean, I always learn something. I'm always amazed as I sit through some of Jennifer's presentations on the, on the great things we've done over the years. Uh, earlier, I spoke about the GSA Design Awards as a celebration. It's equally important to note that the awards program is part of our agency does business. When our 1990 and 1992 juries observed that GSA had to systematically improve the quality of construction, the agency launched our design and construction excellence programs. That bold move was a credit to our jurors' knowledge and to our agencies and us listening. In the GSA design awards that followed, juries evaluated how well we implement design excellence procedures, but, at the but as the definition of the design excellence programs expanded to multiple building types and disciplines, and as GSA embraces a culture of excellence more generally, Today's juries are drawing conclusions about GSA as a client, a collaborator, and a steward. So simply put, jurors keep pointing us forward, and this jury did that as well. So with that said, I'd like to welcome our jurors and to acknowledge their service. As in previous design award cycles, our panelists are experts in their respective fields. They also represent a variety of career stages and local communities. This diversity of perspectives is something that GSA brings to the table for every project, and I'm grateful to the Design Excellence Program for assembling this group and for uh, documenting their insights. So please hold your applause while I introduce the jurors, but the jurors, would you please stand so the audience may thank you for your uh, reconvening for this special occasion. We have jury chair, Kurt Moody, chairman of the board, Moody Nolan. 
Mark Kane, President and CEO of Smoot Construction. Ariel O'Connor, Conservator, Smithsonian National Museum of Asian Art. Jasper Powa, Director of Capital Planning, DC Public Library. Peggy Van Opel, Managing Principal and Washington, DC Office Director of Thornton Tomasetti. Taryn Williams, Senior Project Manager, Simpson, Gupperts, and Hager, and President of the Association for Preservation Technology International. Uh, Jay Joon Young, Co-Founder of Worrell Young. And I'd also like to acknowledge those juries that were not able to make it today. Kay Sargent, Director of Workplace at HOK. Dolores Zinni, Sculpture Program Director, Maryland Institute, College and Art and Partner at Zinni Mad Mad uh, Madigan and landscape architect Michael Vergasian, principal and, uh, of Michael Vergasian Landscape Architects. I'd like to spend one more moment reflecting on our Design Award juries and how they influenced the course over the years. The Design Awards has been referred to as the most candid of dialogues in the most public of forums. But it's also important to acknowledge that candid dialogue is not limited to the Biennial Awards program. It's part of GSA's DNA. Through our Design Excellence Program, as well as our Construction Excellence Program and Art and Architecture, as you've seen, my GSA colleagues can create forums where private sector peers provide advice about procurement, design development, and construction completion. Just as Design Award jurors critique and strengthen uh, and weak, uh, critique, the, critique the strengths and weaknesses in GSA's portfolio, so these peers devote similar thoughtfulness to the individual efforts of the projects. If there are any peers in the audience, could you please stand so that you can be recognized for your role in helping us in our pursuit of excellence? Thank you. So now I'm gonna turn the microphone over to uh, our Director of Design Excellence, Renee Pallone, who will lead us through why we are all gathered here today, the GSA Design Awards. So, Renee. My name is Renee Pallone, and on behalf of the Design Excellence Program, I'm very excited to convey the awards for 2022. For this award cycle, GSA projects substantially completed within the past 10 years were eligible for recognition. Also eligible in our multidisciplinary on the boards category were commissioner approved concepts that are not yet realized. The awards program recognizes projects at two levels, citations and honor awards. Today's ceremony begins with our citation winners. If you'd like to follow along, you can go to gsa.gov slash design awards for our program and our order of events and our digital awards book. In every award cycle, a jury's primary benchmark is the guiding principles for federal architecture, the 1962 document that drove GSA's launch of the design excellence program. Over the years, different award juries interpret the guiding principles to different ends. In 2022, the jury decided that citation winners would represent innovation and method. The following projects represent new precedents or confirm emerging best practice. Some projects are technical accomplishments, while others illustrate new perspectives. The citation awards are presented in alphabetical order of project name. To the winners who are joining us in the front rows of the auditorium, Please stand as a row and line up behind David there in the corner so that you may come up to the stage after I call your name. Once here, you will receive a certificate and pause for a photograph with the chief architect and the PBS commissioner. Please then proceed off stage and return to your seats. As the winners make their way to the stage, the audience can watch a video that recaps jury commentary about the project. Please hold your applause until after the recipients have received their award on stage. The first citation is awarded to the Arthur J. Altmaier Federal Building in Woodlawn, Maryland in the architecture category. Accepting the award today are Julie Snow, Snow Krylik Architects, Mia Blanchett, HGA, and Brian Muller from Arthur GSA's J. Atlantic Altmaier Region. Arthur J. Altmaier Federal Building, Woodland, Maryland. As an adaptive reuse building, it is one of the prime examples of taking an eyesore for a community and then developing a design approach that not only addressed the energy needs but also 
took into account beautifying a structure as an adaptive reuse building, stripping that building to its core, going through remediation always is a challenge. I would imagine that many people considered demolition of the building as a course of action. But this project could show that no, that isn't the case. This is an example to show many different clientele that you can do something beyond just fixing up, that you could do something that results in community pride because the creativity is not just doing the work that says we can make it work again. It is extending the life of the building and then creating character. And this project does that. I mean, it has a simple elegance to it that anybody would strive for. The jury actually considered Altmeyer for a number of categories. Landscaping was considered, workplace was considered, but in the jury discussions, though we looked at each of those categories, the end result was more discussion about the building presence. It seemed that the cladding of the building and the projection of an image really rose to the top. And so that character put it in the architecture category more so than the others. The next winning project is the Captain John Foster Williams U.S. Coast Guard Building and Seawall in Boston, Massachusetts, which earned citations in both construction and engineering. Accepting the award is David Dravinsky from GSA's New England region. Captain John Foster Williams, U.S. Coast Guard Building and Seawall, Boston, Massachusetts. This project is a really great example of understanding what our historic fabric was and improving it in order to acknowledge and protect against what has been happening in terms of climate changes and storm surge. There was an ongoing water infiltration issue, regardless of the fact that they were trying to continually upgrade retrofit, but they weren't looking at the issue holistically. So it was a problem with the building and the seawall that was going to continue to propagate and get worse unless they took a step back and looked at it holistically as they did for this project. The jury decided to honor the Williams Building and Seawall project in two categories, construction and engineering. On the construction, it was particularly challenging because of the underwater environment and so being able to access and to pour the new foundations was the point that we thought was the most impressive about this project. In addition, the fact that the engineering and the understanding of the problem and what existed there was completed in depth, it allowed a solution that really minimized the extent of construction needed to address the problem because essentially they were leaving as much as they could in place as opposed to having to remove a lot of the existing structure in order to put it into its final retrofitted condition. Our next citation goes to the Convent Avenue and Juarez Lincoln land ports of entry in Laredo, Texas, for achievement in construction. Joining us today are Chris Hodges, Brasfield and Gorey, and Tom Kalaya from GSA's Greater Southwest Region. Convent Avenue in Juarez Lincoln Land Ports of Entry, Laredo, Texas. This land port is made up of two bridges. There were two different design teams that the construction team collaborated with to bring this project to successful completion. And they used a lot of technology to help the end users envision what the final facility was gonna be. And I'm sure that that promoted 
the decision making and the collaboration and integration of all the parties that were responsible with making this land port a success. The safety record here was remarkable. There was significant emphasis on keeping the labor population safe as evidenced by the result of no lost time incidents. The construction team spent a significant amount of time with daily safety preparation. They had an app developed to keep the labor engaged in good safety protocol and understanding the well-being of the personnel on this site. But the coordination would have been a significant part of just the daily existence of the construction team and being very mindful and intentional about those logistics and how they manage them you know, will have gone to the success of this project. I think of construction projects and the, the opportunities that are in our industry, they're vast. I think the fact that there was continuing access and outreach shows that people that are involved in the project really care and, and are taking their time to expose what they're doing to a younger population in the community. The Dwight D. Eisenhower National Memorial in Washington, D.C. has earned our next citation in landscape architecture. Accepting the award are Roger Courtenay and Mike Arnold of AECOM and Hallie Futterman from GSA's National Capital Region. Dwight D. Eisenhower National Memorial, Washington, D.C. The design and construction of a national memorial in Washington, D.C. is a significant achievement by any standards, but particularly as it relates to the scale and prominence of the Eisenhower Memorial. As a memorial within a four-acre urban park, the jury premiated the landscape of the memorial for its contribution to the city, but also in the degree to which it enriches the ensemble of the landscapes of the monumental core of Washington, D.C. I certainly enjoy the idea that the memorial is within a park setting, and I think it functions that way. That is, that one moves into the park perhaps before one recognizes that they are at a memorial, and the memorial becomes a discovery inside that park. I think the collective feel was that that was one of the strengths of the project. The Eisenhower Memorial was submitted in the architecture category. And the jury felt, in fact, that the landscape was one of the strengths of the memorial, perhaps overlooked because it seems so effortless in its current state, so effective in its initial installation, that it almost seems to transcend the idea of effort and attention. What the jury recognizes is a great deal of attention is required, a great deal of effort is required to implement something that's as effective as it is. And so the decision was to really premiate the landscape piece of the project. Next, in the On the Boards category is a citation for the John A. Volpe National Transportation System Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The following team members will be joining us on stage. From SOM, Mustafa Abadan, Chris Cooper, and Joe Rucco. Judith Bowen from GSA's Nash New England region. John A. Volpe National Transportation System Center, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Having gone to graduate school in Cambridge, right near the Volpe Center, I knew the area from 20 to 30 years ago, and it was a very industrial area where the original Volpe Center fit in very well within that context. It was a laboratory. It was an industrial-looking complex. It didn't connect very well with the surrounding community, but it wasn't intended to. Cambridge has changed in many ways in the past 20 or 30 years, and it has become a place that there is a lot of exciting research in all different types of disciplines 
there is a lot more engagement with the surrounding universities. And so the Volpe Center and the reimagining of it really was looking at a completely different environment. It was designed to put on display what the inner works were of the building, what is actually happening in the building. By the creation of these spaces on the ground floor level, as a member of the general public passing by this building, in particular, if I had been part of the neighborhood before, I'd probably be surprised at and excited by what is happening in this building. I think likely a lot of people had no idea what kinds of research were occurring here and how exciting the mission is. There'll be a lot more interest in what's happening there and hopefully engagement with the surrounding community in trying to understand how they can learn from it. I see that as something that is an educational opportunity and even a recruiting opportunity. Our next citation brings us back to Boston where the John F. Kennedy Building has earned recognition in the category of preservation. Accepting the award are Andrew Dunlap and Zach Rusu, Smith Group, Judith Bowen from JSA's New England region. John F. Kennedy Federal Building, Boston, Massachusetts. The scope of the project was to reglaze this building, and by that I mean replacing all of the glazing in this building that's clad with precast concrete panels, punched windows, and curtain walls of single pane glass and aluminum frames were replaced with better performing dual glaze systems. There was a dramatic change in the U factor of the window assemblies, and that's the permeance of energy through the windows. There's certainly a lot of mid-century modern buildings and brutalist concrete structures. I think the general public's perception of these buildings is changing, and people are starting to regard them more affectionately as part of our architectural history. The application of the reglazing was so faithful to the original, which was part of the intent, that the project was listed on the National Register of Historic Places after the project was completed, and that's really impressive. The original glazing profiles were studied very carefully and matched very closely so that the overall appearance of the building looked a lot like the original. They restored the color of the glass, so if you look at it today, you can't really tell that a rehabilitation or a replacement had taken place. The John F. Kennedy Building reglazing project is an exemplary project for showing us that we can upgrade our historic buildings to improve their energy efficiency, their resistance to air and water infiltration, and their blast resistance while maintaining the historic integrity of the building. Next, a citation in conservation goes to red neon circle fragments on a blue wall in Dayton, Ohio. Accepting the award today, are Emmett Lodge, McKay Lodge Fine Art Conservation Laboratory, and Caroline Sachet from GSA's Great Lakes region. Red Neon Circle Fragments on a Blue Wall, Dayton, Ohio. What was so impressive to the jury was the timing between a building project to help insulate and improve the building and a project to update the neon so that it was functional and sustainable at the same time. The neon aspects of the work are akin to brushstrokes on a painting. If they don't function, it's like the paint is invisible on the canvas. And in this case, it wasn't functional. The tubes were broken, the panels didn't function, and one of the aspects of this project that was very important to the jury was that care was taken to trace the outlines of the original neon tubes that needed to be replaced. So the new replacements were exactly the same shape as the originals. On the 50th anniversary of GSA's art and architecture program, 
our jury panel really highlights and wants to emphasize that the stewardship and conservation of artwork is as important as commissioning of new pieces. And the red neon conservation treatment is a wonderful example of that stewardship that will continue for decades to come. Neon is a challenging material for conservators because it really blurs the lines between restoration, the idea of remaking a part and making it look new again, and conservation, the idea of keeping the original as it is. And this treatment really highlights some of the challenges in that, in that parts of this artwork needed to be replaced and replicated. And there wasn't a good benchmark for how to measure the intensity or the color of the original neon in 1978. So choices have to be made today about your best guess as to what it was originally. But we can document those choices and we can do our best to pick a color that's the closest we believe to what it was originally. And we document it so that the next versions of ourselves have that information to do this again. The Robert C. Weaver Federal Building in Washington, D.C. has won a citation in our workplace category. Accepting the award are Annika Landrino from HOK and Harvey Mariah from GSA's National Capital Region. Robert C. Weaver Federal Building, Washington, D.C. The Robert C. Weaver Building is a brutalist building by Marcel Breuer. It is a prime example of the brutalist architecture that Marcel Breuer did at the height of his career. What's unique about this building is the dimensional facade, which is faceted at the scale of the human body, but collectively at a much larger scale creates a very subtle and gentle curve. The existing conditions before were very dark, compressed, and very drab. I could imagine that it would be very depressing to work in those spaces, given how dark it was, and felt kind of maze-like and completely removed from a sense of the outdoors. There is so much building stock of this typology and of this time period. I think this project is exemplary of how we should be treating a lot of these buildings. I think the interior layouts of this project was certainly cognizant of the curved nature of the floor plan and the footprint. And I imagine the experience of the building is intrinsic to those curves and that quality of the project by Breuer was certainly preserved. Our next citation is for urban design and planning, which goes to the Tomochichi Federal Building and U.S. Courthouse Annex in Savannah, Georgia. Joining us on stage will be Larry Speck from Page and Sam Harris from GSA's Southeast Sunbelt Region. Tomochichi Federal Building and U.S. Courthouse Annex, Savannah, Georgia. What I thought was pretty remarkable about this project was not only how it was integrated very carefully and thoughtfully into the historic grid of Savannah, but how much public outreach there was and how closely the design process integrated that feedback into the building's design so that it was designed for all the people who use the building, the people who work there and the people who come in. The annex was designed to sensitively fit into its surroundings and to simply but elegantly refer to the materials on the building surrounding it. The impression that one would get upon looking at this building for the first time is how nicely and sensitively it fits into its surroundings, into the grid. And it's very clear that it's a contemporary structure. It's also easy to see how it refers to the buildings around it without being an exact copy. And so it's a good contemporary example of a new building in its surroundings.
Today we have a second citation in the preservation category presented to the United States Custom House in San Ysidro, California. Accepting the award is Jill Manzi and Patty Weber from GSA's Pacific Rim region. United States Custom House, San Ysidro, California. This is a structure built in 1933 in the Spanish colonial revival style that was the original port of entry in San Ysidro. It had a port cachere with two lanes of traffic and it was the building that handled the traffic at the border. It's pretty amazing that it was saved at all and that was one of the most important decisions for the project to retain it and to give it a function again. The scope of the project consisted in removing some of the additions that had been added on over the years in the courtyard and adding an addition to the north to handle the pedestrian traffic that was a lot more architecturally sensitive to the original design. The north addition on the building handles pedestrian traffic between the U.S. and Mexico. And when you walk through, there's actually an opening in the roof that brings some sunlight down onto the path. It's a much more welcoming experience than it might otherwise have been. GSA has a wealth of historic buildings from eras that many of us as Americans revere from the late 19th and early 20th centuries. GSA is in the position to set an example of what a good preservation project looks like by choosing to reuse and rehabilitate our historic buildings. Our final citation of the 2022 GSA Design Awards is being awarded to the United States Courts Consolidation, which took place within the Conrad B. Duberstein U.S. Post Office and Courthouse in Brooklyn, New York. Accepting the citation in the workplace category are Catherine Selby, Datner Architects, and Robert Olihan from GSA's Northeast and Caribbean region. USC Consolidation, Conrad B. Duberstein, U.S. Post Office and Courthouse, Brooklyn, New York. I think one of the biggest challenges when you're designing a project is to have concept control and to contextualize the project for the type of building and the purpose of that building. And we thought that this design showed excellent constraint, but a level of sophistication that was fitting. One of the things that we enjoyed about this building is that it paid a nod to the historic significance of the building and the interiors really supported that and wasn't overbearing or overwhelming. It was very respectfully done and executed well. In any large government building, you have a whole variety of spaces and tying those together can be really a challenge, but there was a common thread, a common language, a common palette, a common sense of detail that really flowed through this building. I think one of the things that all designers and architects struggle with with the designing these types of spaces is do we design it in the period that it was built? Do we design it in a more contemporary version of that? And I think this project is an excellent example of both respecting the historic nature, but designing the spaces in a contemporary way that feel fresh, that feel relevant, but harmonious. I think one of the challenges in all of these buildings also is being fiscally responsible, but also bringing the appropriate level or significance to bear on these projects. And I think this project is respectful to both of those requirements. Congratulations to all of our citation winners. Now we move to the honor awards. In this higher level of recognition, Projects have once again broken ground for both the public and private sectors to emulate. The 2022 honor winners also exemplify this jury's emphasis on human experience. As you'll see in the accompanying videos, the jury advocated for investments that move people. These projects empathize with a traveler crossing the border, a public servant going to work, or a citizen reflecting on American democracy. The first project in this series is an honor award winner in two categories, architecture and landscape architecture. 
accepting the honor awards on behalf of the Columbus Land Port of Entry in Columbus, New Mexico are David Richter and Elizabeth Chu Richter, as well as Maya Richter Hernandez from Richter Architects, Gregory Miller from MRWM Landscape Architects, and Danny Partida from GSA's Greater Southwest Region. Columbus Land Port of Entry, Columbus, New Mexico. Design evokes emotional reactions in all of us, right? That's the power of design. And I think the way this design is so gently embracing the ecology that it's part of, the desert, touches you at some neurological level. This departs from what we stereotypically expect, right? So there's delight in that, there is comfort in that. It's not untouched terrain. It is an intervention that humans have made, but the way it's been done is very harmonious with its ecology. And that is very compelling, restorative in several ways. The Columbus Land Port of Entry is a series of simple gestures. It's not making these monumental gestures. The simple geometry of the building and the way it's very rooted in does not try to dominate the landscape. And it just makes the whole experience very humanistic. I think for something that can be a very stressful experience or a very intimidating experience, the design by its very nature sets the tone for a very different, diametrically opposite experience. Ultimately, it's the sensitive treatment of the built form and the way the materiality harmonizes with its ecology, I think really resonated with the jury for the jury to say this is a clear winner. Next is the first on the board's workplace design to earn an honor award in this program's 32 year history. The Department of State Workspace Prototypes in Washington, DC. Joining us to accept are Judica Behati, Studios Architecture, and Arlene Graham from GSA. Department of State Workspace Prototypes, Washington, D.C. What excited the jury about this project is the fact that the whole world is grappling right now with the way we work, workplace, and what that means. And so this package really put together a holistic approach about the types of workspaces that we could be creating that really would be enticing and alluring, but also really be flexible and enabling people to do their best work. The jury loved that it included mechanical, electrical, and acoustical considerations as well. In today's workspace, we need to make sure that we're creating spaces that have a diverse settings and offering for individuals. It sets a precedent, not only for the Department of State, but beyond that to other federal agencies. One of the things that I think is hard for people as they imagine the workplace of the future is to get a visual image of what that could actually be. This project does an excellent job of really illustrating, not only in plan view, but in an isometric view and other renderings and graphics to really help the user understand the spaces that they would be getting and get excited about the potential. One of the biggest challenges I think in federal projects is that the scale and the size of many of these buildings are massive. And that often leads to long, narrow corridors. But in this prototype, they really celebrated how to create neighborhoods. We were really excited about the potential that this project has because we truly are at an interesting intersection of the past and the future. And to help people go forward, it's critical that we think bigger and bring new, fresh ideas. And this project is an excellent example of that. Our next honor award for construction goes to the FBI Central Records Complex in Winchester, Virginia. Accepting the award are David Pastrick, Clark Construction, Jared Price from GSA's Mid-Atlantic Region, 
Harlan Castillo, and Teresa Fitzgerald from the FBI. FBI Central Records Complex, Winchester, Virginia. This is the central facility that houses all information that needs to be kept, accessed, and retrieved. This was a major undertaking to really centralize their process and provide quicker access to information that might be needed on ongoing investigations. But it was obvious that there was a great collaboration on the project. The project had an initial requirement to do partnering as many of the GSA projects do, but the application really emphasized that the collaboration and the partnering effort continued throughout the project. And I think the result that we all saw was a project that performed better than anticipated on an overall basis. I think it was obvious here that in the area of records automation and retrieval, and the mechanical and electrical disciplines that the vendor that provided that technology and built it helped the overall team make decisions that that was the right approach in terms of the technology that they could offer and that that got built into the design appropriately. Any project is about the team. When you're building, when you're evaluating a project for construction, the complexities that are handled with the team members in relation to the actual outcome that is realized is a very important part of what we do as contractors. That's really the takeaway here when you think about collaboration. How quickly can you get to trust and really get aligned with the project's mission and know everybody on the team is working toward that and then make the best decisions for the project. In the 2022 award cycle, winning art and architecture projects all ranked at the honor level. The first of these four winners is the Fruit of the Spirit installed in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. May I welcome to the stage Misha and Musa Brooker with the estate of Mo Brooker and Carrie Rose from GSA's Mid-Atlantic region. The Fruit of the Spirit, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Fruit of the Spirit is a unique work of art. It's, I think it's a celebration of life. It's a song of hope and is activating the building by activating the public. It's a way of interacting, not only with the architecture, but with the people that transit and use that building. In a novel way, public art should be open to any possibilities that the site offers. And that's why I think that's the beauty of this project. The two artists, Brooker and Charles Sear, were friends. They studied in Philadelphia together in the 70s. What I think is very compelling is this idea that the dialogue between the two artworks is based really on a deep knowledge of them both. Brooker was very much aware of the palette that his fellow used and replicating it in another language, but really taking care of that aspect. So all those things are remarkable. The next honor award in art is Hedge Wedge located in San Diego, California. Accepting the award are Mario Ramirez and Patty Weber from GSA's Pacific Rim region. Hedge Wedge, San Diego, California. The jury felt that the strength of the Hedge Wedge was the degree to which it was integrated into the larger project. We understand that it was a collaborative effort between artist, architect, and landscape architect. And the jury feels that that shows in the success of the individual piece, that its integration into the topography, into the movement of people, 
and into the plaza that is the foreground for the particular piece and the drift of trees that dance along that edge are an important part of the success of the piece as a whole. When art and the integration of art works at its best, it's an extraordinary result that produces richer place, a richer experience than I think any of the disciplines can achieve independently. The activation of the Federal Plaza has been a challenge over the course of its history. The hedge Wedge has the capacity to activate this place through the choreography of the movement of people up and across. It creates a kind of dance and movement of people that will activate the place through its motion and its activity. The third artwork, The Robes of Justitia, is a welcome addition to the public realm of Nashville, Tennessee. Accepting this honor award are the artist, Allison Schatz, and Charlie Hearn from GSA's Southeast Sunbelt region. The Robes of Justitia, Nashville, Tennessee, this project provoked the most thought and conversation in the jury room of any project that we reviewed. Some people were very moved and engaged by the imagery of drapery on such a large scale. And for some of the jury, it evoked a feeling of warmth and being enveloped in drapery in a space that could be very intimidating. And for other people on the jury, the large scale of the folds in the drapery had a sense of diminutiveness for the person walking into the space. So that's what great art is. It's subject to interpretation and debate. As a conservator on the jury panel, I often think about materials. And one of the things I brought to the jury's attention is this choice of a very traditional medium. A mosaic on a ceiling has been used for millennia in architecture. And what's so wonderful about the longevity of this material is it can withstand changes in humidity and temperature, and that is the perfect combination to me of art and conservation. What drew me to the image was the abstractness of a traditional material, and my initial reaction to seeing the image was an abstract design, and then when I realized it was folds of drapery, and then I realized the scale of it, it to me became very uplifting, and it became a pattern, or it became a, an image that wanted to draw me into the space in a building that for many people can be very intimidating. The installation, the choice of materials and how integrated it was into the building was something that we all resonated with. And what we all unanimously decided is that it deserved an honor award for the collaboration, for the ingenuity, for the use of traditional materials in a modern way, and for the right choice for the right place. The United States Courthouse in Los Angeles, California has earned an honor award in the architecture category. It is worth noting that the Los Angeles Courthouse originally earned notice as a concept in the 2016 award cycle when it won in our on the boards category. It is a pleasure to celebrate the finished product here with Craig Hartman and Jose Palacios from SOM and Mario Ramirez from GSA's Pacific Rim region. The United States Courthouse, Los Angeles, California. Many projects don't advance in the same way that they're conceptualized. We see projects that, boy, it has a great idea. And then for various reasons, those ideas don't get executed. This one did. This one rose to the occasion. The building is actually performing in a way that the designers anticipated it would. This is an architecture and engineering feat. And it goes to all disciplines. It means that Somebody took great pains to make sure that when it came to sustainability, that it wasn't just systems. It was features, the cladding on the building, the orientation of the building, the orientation of the glass and how it was treated so that you could actually bring in natural light to the core of the building. 
at the same time protect it from high temperatures. On the Los Angeles courthouse, one of the things that intrigued the entire jury was the fact that we not only had the triangulated glass on the exterior skin on all four sides, but we had a core that actually allowed natural light to come in from the roof to the ground floor. And it was done in such a way that they played off each other, the exterior skin and then the interior core. That natural light effect, wherever you may go, had a very positive effect, uh, we believe, on the occupants. It was the only unanimous choice of the jury. Finally, the last award is an honor award for the artwork Yosemite Falls, an art and architecture commission mounted in the Los Angeles court, courthouse atrium. Accepting is Patty Weber from GSA's Pacific Rim region. Yosemite Falls, Los Angeles, California. This work by Catherine Oppie shows us that art affects how people think of the function of the building. What I think is particular about this project is that the artist is using the landscape vertically. She's pointing at this idea of the power of history of a continuity of some institutions and how they can be centered in an individual. And thus, as a hiker hiking a mountain can go and be in that place, also having a sense of maybe calm or belonging to a place that has been there before and continue to be afterwards as part of a much bigger scheme. I think that Opie's project is a classical project that the beauty of it is that it can look very simple and is so complex in many aspects, not only in the technical resolutions of her great expertise in photography, but also in how she is generous and contemplative of the people that are in the building. That is the artist putting herself in the place of saying, what can I do to make the people that are in the building not only think about the function of the building itself, but have comforting, calming experience and even transcendental experience. I can imagine the people that work there every day, they will see things, different things every day in this amazing piece of work. Thank you all, I hope you enjoyed this. When you look back at the six years this represents, wow, wow what a ride. Uh, th those six years that these projects were accomplished in kind of refreshes me on what GSA did during that time frame and the successes we have. And sessions like this really reinvigorate me as I, as I look forward to where we're gonna go. And, and, and that's with all your help. So can we get one last round of applause for the jurors? One last round of applause for the award winners. And then a final applause for the best industry design and construction for anybody to be in and hope you encourage others, so for all of you. And that concludes the ceremony, so go out and have some fun and celebrate some great successes. Thanks.